Well, hello there. My name is Beth Gaff, and I am the Systems Manager, Technology Trainer, and Robotics Instructor here at the Peabody Public Library. Welcome back to another session of Virtual Field Trips, Travels, and Destinations. Today, we're going to be taking a tour of the White House. I'm really, really excited about this. Um, I have never been in the White House, so doing a 360 tour um, will be great. Uh, just so you know, our 360 tour ended up dropping off. Not sure why. Um, but you can pick those up later when you do this on your own. Um, but I have given you videos to accommodate in those areas. So hopefully that helps. I've also included some lesson plans, activities, um, everything you need to have a nice activity or lesson for the White House. So thank you so much for being a part of it. Without you, there'd be no reason to do it. Um, so I don't want to waste any more time. Let's take a look at the White House. Well, hello there. Welcome back to another session of virtual field trips, destinations, and visits. My name is Beth Gaff, and I am the systems manager, uh, technology trainer, and robotics instructor here at the Peabody Public Library. I do try to get these out every month. Uh, however, sometimes time gets away from me, and uh, I don't necessarily always get them out. So. I'm really excited to have the time today that I can sit down and do this uh, virtual field trip for you. Today we're going to be exploring the White House. Uh, I thought this would be a really good opportunity uh, with different kinds of elections coming up uh, in the next couple of years as well as locally and uh, I thought maybe we would like to take just a, a little virtual tour. Um, I will be including some free resources that you can get online. Uh, that you could implement into this field trip. Um, I'm also going to go through a PowerPoint uh, and I'm going to give you this PowerPoint as well. So if this is something you would like to teach in your classes, then you would be able to. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up that PowerPoint first. Uh, this did come from the same site that we are going to go take that 360 degree tour, but I thought it would be fun for us to go through uh, this first. So welcome. The activities in this digital notebook are designed to accompany you as you explore the 360 degree tour of the White House. There are vocabulary words, questions, and prompts, as well as additional information for objects, artwork, and rooms you'll see on the tour. If you have any questions about these materials, um, you can get in contact with education at whha.org. Uh, this digital notebook is designed to offer three slides for each space you and I will be experiencing on the tour. The first slide has a picture and an overview of the space. The second highlights an object from that space. And the third slide asks two questions about the importance of the object and space to the overall history of the White House. Please visit these slides in Master View if you need to make changes, uh, then you would be able to do so. Um, so navigational tips for a guided tour of the White House, click the small arrow at the bottom. Ooh, this is exciting. Uh, we will be looking at that tour here in a moment. Um, we can use the icons as play buttons, and uh, there's a navigational 3D space that we could do on our own. So these are the rooms on the 360 tour that we're going to be taking a look at. They have the ground floor, which is the East Wing and the Family Theater, uh, the East Garden, the ground floor corridor, the library, uh, Vermeil Room, the China Room, uh, on the state floor, they have the east, green, blue, red state uh, blue, uh, rooms, uh, state dining room, cross hall, and the entrance hall. So entering the White House on the east wing, the entrance on the east, east wing of the White House as it appeared since it, in expansion in 1942. The tour begins in the east wing lobby an area that has a waiting room, security, and offices for the First Lady and her staff. Most visitors to the White House enter through the East Wing, constructed in 1902 and expanded in 1942. Upon entering the East Wing, visitors walk along, and I may be saying it wrong, colonnade, 
a long corridor with columns and large glass windows facing the south lawn. Uh, similar similar uh, colon, colonnades run along the west wing where the president and the staff work, uh, but the west wing colonnade is outdoors. So you can kind of see that here. Um, so that's pretty interesting. This is the family theater. Across from the windows along the colonnade, uh, colonnade is the family theater, a private movie theater just for the first family and their guests. The family theater was first used as a coat room for guests attending the White House events. In 1942, pres 42, President Franklin D. Roosevelt converted it into a theater so he could watch newsreels about World War II. Since then, the theater has undergone updates in decor and technology. Even so, the current theater still gets used as a coat room when there are large events at the White House. So here's a picture of President George H.W. Bush and First Lady Barbara Bush in the White House Family Theater. And uh, it looks like Mrs. Bush is sharing a seat with her grandson, John Ellis Bush. The East Wing of the Family Theater. Use the 360 tour to explore the Family Theater. Why might the Family Theater be located in this space? Why does the first family need their own movie theater? Well, let's go ahead and minimize this. Go to our tour. And load up our tour. So this is what they were taught. Let me go ahead and get us in full screen. Okay, so let's go here. This is the East Wing. Um, and this is what they were talking about. East Wing was constructed in 1942 to house additional staff during World War II. Since 1977, this wing has served as a location uh, of the office of the First Lady. So then we can kind of go around here. Let's take a look at this room. Uh, this is a picture of Nancy Reagan outside of let me choose this. Uh, Woodrow Wilson. 1913. Okay. All right. Well, this would be the East Wing. And if we go into our search, then we have a lot of other options here. So here's where we are. Nancy Reagan, this is where we were. Uh, this is all the East Wing. Oh, this is a George Washington. That's pretty cool. Okay, so that was all. Um, let me flip us back around here. That was all of the East Wing. And let's go back to our PowerPoints. I did not see the, um, maybe it's listed here. Let's search for the family theater. Here we go. Here is the family theater. Let's close this. So here's an up close and personal view of the family theater. Just kind of turning us around here so you can get a better view. Family theater was originally part, um, it was actually a cloak room and he converted it into a theater to view wartime newsreels. 
So um, we're going to use, let's go ahead and maximize this. Oops. Let's go back. Use uh, the 360 tour. Why might the family theater be located in this space? Why does the first family need their own? Uh, so hopefully we read a little bit more about this. Let's see what this said. So they would need a private theater just so that they could watch um, their movies as they would like, um, having it in the White House. So therefore, they would not have to go out into the public, I would imagine. Uh, the family theater was built as a coat room for guests. Now is the state of the art space for entertaining for the first family. Why is it important for the White House to use modern technology? So they're able to watch the most current stuff, I would imagine. Um, I don't know. Maybe you guys can fill this out and come up with these answers as well. So these are just a couple of questions that have to do with the East Wing and the Family Theater. So now we're going to talk about the East Garden. At the end of the East Wing, or long row of columns, um, is the East Garden Room from which visitors can enter the ground floor of the building or look outside to the Jacqueline Kennedy Garden uh, and the South Lawn. Uh, the East Garden Room is also the site of the White House Historical Association gift shop. Proceeds from this shop fund acquisitions of additions to the White House collection and uh, preservation of the uh, executive mansion. Uh, so there is a bronze bust of Abraham, President Abraham Lincoln located in the East Garden Room. A Porglum, an American sculptor, or this person, is most commonly known for his design of work of Mount Rushmore from 1927 to 1941. Uh, Borglum made this bust of Lincoln in 1908. The large bust is installed atop a pillar and has historically been displayed in the East Garden Room, visible to the public visitors and guests as they enter the White House through the East Wing. It can be seen from the other side of the colonnade and is one of the first pieces of art seen by visitors. Let's see what this is. So this just tells you a little bit more about this particular bust of art. Go back to our PowerPoint. Okay, use the 360 tour to look around the East Garden Room. All right, let's do that. We are going to, let's get in full mode here. Um, we're going to go to the East Garden Room. And I find it's easier if we just type it in. The East Garden Room. All right, so here's the East Garden Room. So we're going to go ahead and go in there. East Garden Room looks out onto the Jacqueline Kennedy Garden, a garden that was historically transformed by First Ladies Edith Roosevelt and Ellen Wilson. In 1965, Lady Bird Johnson oversaw the garden's redesign and named it after Mrs. Kennedy in honor of her, of her efforts to revitalize the White House. And here is that statue that we were just talking about that was created in 1908. This is Chester A. Arthur. Oh, goodness. Millard Fillmore. What a beautiful room. So this is the East Garden Room. Why, oh, we're not even on that page. Uh, can you identify any of the other president portrait, portraits? What piece of art seems to be the most noticeable in the room and why? 
The East Garden Room is the room from which guests enter the ground floor corridor of the White House itself. Why might this bust of the President Lincoln be located just outside the doors to the main area of the White House? Um, how do you and other White House visitors feel when you see President Lincoln? So those would be really great questions that have to do with that artwork. This corridor that stretches between the East Wing and the West Wing was originally a dimly lit basement hallway. And the rooms along the corridor were service spaces, at one time used as a living space by enslaved and free workers. The arched ceiling was intended to support the state floor above, although now it is mainly decorative. During President Theodore Roosevelt's presidency, 1901 through 1909, this hallway was transformed into a space for displaying art and objects. The stairway leading to the state floor was also added at that time. Today, many portraits of first ladies hang here. There is a portrait of Hillary Clinton. This portrait of First Lady Hillary Clinton was painted by renowned artist Simi, Simi Knox in 2002 after Bill Clinton left office. Knox, uh, who also painted the official portrait of President Clinton, became the first African-American selected to complete an official White House portrait. In this portrait, Mrs. Clinton is standing next to a table with a copy of her book, It Takes a Village, as well as a piece of 200th anniversary White House China. Mrs. Clinton surpassed Pat Nixon's record as most traveled first lady during her time in office. A Chicago native, she told uh, she holds a law degree from Yale University. Both portraits of the Clinton by Mr. Knox debuted in the East Room of the White House on June 14, 2004. So let's take a look um, at the ground floor corridor. See if we can find the ground floor corridor. I'm finding it so much easier just to. Okay, let's go back and I want to turn this on. There we go. You are now entering the ground floor, part of the original structure of the White House. The ground floor was included in the original White House plans and was considered a basement to the state floor. Originally, this floor looked very different than it does today. The historic ground floor included laundry space, storage space, as well as the White House kitchens. The ground floor originally housed most of the enslaved and domestic servants for the White House, and they lived on this floor in extremely dark, damp, and even rodent-infested conditions and the space was considered to have extreme temperature disparities. Throughout the 19th century, improvements were gradually made to the basement floor, and it included a plumbing system and a heating system and furnace. Starting at the 20th century with the 1902 Roosevelt administration reconstruction of the White House, the ground floor transformed into a series of coat rooms and powder rooms and then later on was transformed into a series of display rooms, which now exist today. In addition to the White House Library, there's also the White House China Room, as well as the Verme Room, which houses a fantastic collection of Verme or gilded silver, which was added to the White House during the Dwight D. Eisenhower administration. The ground floor is also home to many portraits of First Ladies, including Jacqueline Kennedy, Hillary Clinton, and Laura Bush. Okay, so let's take a look at this. I was kind of wanting to, let's go there. There we go. So here's the China cabinet, I'm assuming. Let's see. Let's see here. Um, this is the break front bookshelf. Pretty cool. All right, let's go back to where we were.
All right, so the library. President Franklin D. Roosevelt designated this room the library in 1935. Before that time, it was mostly used for storage or as a laundry room. Roosevelt helped design and furnish the room. Later presidents replaced the shelves and redecorated, but Roosevelt's initial concept remains. The books in this room, um, more than 2,800 in number, represent the best of American history and literature. The library is used by the first family and the White House staff. There is a wax bust of James Hoban. Uh, this image shows James Hoban, the Irish-born architect or building designer of the White House, and many other Washington, D.C. landmarks. James Hoban was the winner of a competition held by President George Washington to design a new home for the president in the nation's new capital of Washington, D.C. The portrait is attributed to John Christian Rauschner, a German sculptor who specialized in wax portraits. Uh, it was acquired or bought for the White House collection by the White House Historical Association in 1976. And there is a link down here that you would be able to click on to learn more about James Hoban. So here are some questions that are affiliated. Let's take a look at the library. And again, I'm finding it's so much easier just to type it in. Okay, we are now in the library. Let's take a look around before we actually go look at that video. Uh, let's see what's in here. We have, oops. Wow, I didn't mean to do that. There we go. All right, so we have a chief. There we go. Uh, we have several Indians here, and I'm sure they're going to explain that to us in our video. What's this? Okay, armory from the 17th, uh, the 18th century. There's that James Hoban. Perfect. All right, let's take a look at the video. The library is located on the ground floor of the White House, and it's one of the first rooms you'll see on the public tour. Historically, the ground floor has been used primarily as a service space, and in its earlier iteration, the library was used as a laundry. It was also used for storage, for things like tubs, lumber, but only in 1935 did it become a designated space as a library. Franklin Roosevelt wanted to have a distinct separate library for the White House. Ever since then, the library has grown. Today you can find over 2,700 volumes. They are intended to represent the very best of American history, culture, politics, philosophy that are available to the President, the First Lady, or White House staff anytime they want. They rest on shelves that were actually repurposed and salvaged from White House wood. During the Truman renovation between 1948 to 1952, pieces of the old timbers were taken and reused and repurposed and turned into these bookshelves for the library. One of the most noteworthy items in the room is the George O'Keefe painting above the fireplace. It was acquired for the White House collection in 1997. This depicts a scene at Taos near Bear Lake, New Mexico, and it was the first major acquisition of a woman artist of the 20th century. In addition to the Georgia O'Keeffe painting, there are a series of Native American portraits done by Charles Byrd King. There are five Native American portraits of the delegation that came to the White House during the presidency of James Monroe. On one wall, you'll see four of these delegates, but as you exit the library, you'll see the fifth, the only female who was present for the delegate's visit. There's also a small likeness of the original White House architect James Hoban located in the library. I love learning stuff. Okay, let's go back. So you would be able to answer some of these questions in regards to the James Hoban art. Um, you may need to click on that link I was showing you before so you can get in there and look at them. 
Uh, the Vermeil Room, originally a service space, the first room on the south side of the corridor was made a ladies sitting room during the theater Roosevelt renovation or redesign in 1957. The White House received a gift of more than 1500 objects of gold plated silver or ver Vermeil. So it's a silver room. President and First Lady Eisenhower accepted the collection and used the pieces to decorate this space on the ground floor, naming it the Vermeil Room. Since then, it has served as a show place to display these beautiful pieces of well, as well as several portraits of First Ladies. Resurrection. This painting was done by Alma Thomas, who was an educator and artist in Washington, D.C. for most of her career. She was a member of the Washington uh, Color School, an art movement partially defined by the use of bold, solid colors. This painting was unveiled as part of the White House collection during Black History Month to 2015 and is the first in this collection by an African-American woman. This painting was acquired or bought for the White House collection with support from Do George W. Hartstog Jr. and the White House Acquisition Trust White House Historical Association. And at this link here, you can learn a little bit more about Alma Thomas. So you will probably want to click on that link so you can learn a little bit more about her painting of the resurrection. So you're able to answer some of these questions. Uh, actually, let's go back and see if. Go. Let's go see if we can find the Vermeil room. go. This is the Vermeil Room. Uh, it showcases objects from a collection of more than 1,500 pieces. So let's take a look at some of these. There's our uh, resurrection post picture, as well as some of that uh, silver that was brought in. Uh, there's that picture of uh, Jacqueline Kennedy which is in the Silver Room. We also have uh, Patricia Nixon. Okay, this is a special kind of art table. Okay, so we can definitely see all the silver and everything that's in this room. Very nice. The China Room. First Lady Edith Wilson named this room the China Room in 1917 and established it as a space to display the growing collection of historic White House tableware. However, it was First Lady uh, Caroline Harrison who was the first to begin collecting the pieces from previous administrations as early as 1890. The objects themselves represent changing presidential tastes and offer a glimpse into the White House's culinary history. Uh, nearly every president is represented in some way. So the oyster plates, this porcelain, or porcelain oyster plate was made by Haviland and Company of New York City in Le Mose, France in 1979. President Ruff, Rutherford Burt B. Hayes purchased the plate as part of a state dinner service or set that featured elaborate designs by American artist Theodore, Theodore Russell Davis. First Lady Luck Hay, Lucy Hayes uh, had planned for a floral pattern when she had a meeting with Davis. Davis suggested that instead she opt for uh, depi depictions of plants and animals native to North America. Mrs. Hayes agreed. She commissioned Davis as the designer and he produced 130 distinct decorations for the 562 piece service. Wow, so you can go here and click and learn a little bit more about that China Room. Let's take a look at the China Room. Okay. 
Here is our China room. And it just houses and displays. What do we got here? It's kind of hard to see that. The farming land is the name of that picture. So here's some, uh, this is the most Monroe State Service. Nice. Clinton Anniversary Service. Wow, it's lots. Hayes Dinner Service. And who do we got here? Okay, all right. So that's the China Room. Interesting enough. Uh, the East Room is the largest room in the White House. It was always intended as a ceremonial space, but it has not always been used that way. The room was unfinished when the first White House uh, residents, John and Abigail Adams, arrived in 1800. Since its completion in 1829, this ground space has been used to celebrate holidays, weddings, and other festive events, including the high school prom of Susan Ford, daughter of President Gerald Ford. The East Room has also been the site of a somber event like presidential funerals. Uh, the room is regularly used for press conferences and bill signings. Here is a portrait of George uh, Washington. This portrait was painted by Gilbert Stewart. While other artists had depicted Washington as a military leader, Stewart became the first artist to paint an authoritative image of Washington as the country's first president. Washington still holds a sword in his left hand, but appears in civilian clothes, showing he is no longer a military leader. A book entitled Constitution and Laws of the United States leans against the table leg. The portrait was installed in the White House in November 1800. During the War of 1812, as the British headed toward Washington, D.C., First Lady Dolly Madison ordered the free and enslaved White House workers to save the portrait so it wouldn't be burned. The painting returned to the White House after it was rebuilt in 1817 and has remained on display since then. Uh, here is a link to tell you a little bit more about the burning of the White House. I'm curious, so I'm going to click it. Um, the young national capital of Washington, D.C. became the center of the War of 1812 with the Great Britain during the summer of 1814. The burning of the public buildings by the British was a humiliating defeat that uh, struck at the symbolic heart of the country. Up from the ashes of that bitter blow, um, a resilient nation emerged stronger and more unified. This project was conceived to provide an overview of the War of 1812, the burning of Washington in 1814, the flight and return of the Madisons during that crisis, and the war's aftermath on the city. The focus is on the president's house, but throughout this collection, there are links to resources with more information of the War of 1812. Okay, so I got out of our tour. There it is. Okay, so I had to click it because I wanted to know more about that, but let's go in here. Go back to our search. So when we're ready, we're ready. Okay. Very interesting. So that link will probably tell you a little bit more as well of about the portrait of George Washington. So you're able to answer these questions. The Green Room has been called by uh, this name since 1818, where President James Monroe, the fifth U.S. president, chose the color for his decorations. Although Thomas Jefferson used the room for dining, it has mostly been used as a sitting room for teas, interviews, and small parties. This room has experienced some changes over the years, though. For example, First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy added several American paintings to the room in the 1960s. 
The builders in the painting featured in the green room um, and was painted by Jacob Lawrence in 1947. Lawrence is remembered as a celebrity black artist known for using geomet geometric shapes, vivid colors, and energetic movement to portray the black experience in America. Many of his pieces show scenes related to equality and civil rights, labor, war, and daily life. Art historians William Kloss wrote of the builders. The metaphor was not of pulling oneself up by one's bootstraps, but of cooperative civil action, of working together for a people's advancement. In 2007, the White House Historical Association purchased this artwork and then donated it to the permanent White House collection. It was selected by First Lady Laura Bush during her refurbishment of the Green Room. Uh, so this link would obviously take you into more about the builders, um, which then you'd be able to answer these questions. So let's go back to the tour. Well, let's refresh. I don't know what happened to our tour. Let me refresh again. Gonna see if I can find it here. Let me go back. Our tour went away. I don't know where it went. Get out of there. Oh, here we go. I don't think this is it. Let's go back. Well, I just don't know what happened to our tour. Our 360 tour went away. Hmm. Well, let's go back to the PowerPoint and we'll just kind of just kind of wing it and maybe it'll come back up. So we saw that, sorry, I'm a little, okay, we wanted to see the green room. So we'll need to go back and see, because we have the blue room also. Well, silly thing. Well, let's see if this makes a difference. The green room. Let's go in there. And let's watch a video about the green room. The green room of the White House is the least formal parlor on the state floor and the most American. President John Adams originally may have used the room as a bedroom for one of his secretaries, and then President Thomas Jefferson transformed it into a dining space. Over time, the use of the room transformed and is typically used for small meetings, gatherings, and even teas. President James Monroe is the one that added the green silk wall hangings and gave the room its name, the Green Room. And it is the first parlor on the state floor to be named after a color. The Green Room is also an art gallery, just as the Blue Room and the Red Room are, and it features many paintings by various American artists, international artists, and paintings of presidents and other notable historical figures. One of the room's most interesting paintings is Sand Dunes at Sunset Atlantic City by the artist Henry Asawa Tanner. Tanner completed the painting in 1885, and it was added to the White House collection in 1995 by the Clinton White House with assistance from the White House Historical Association. The painting is the first example of a piece of art by an African-American artist in the White House collection. Other paintings in the room depict scenes from American history, like the painting Independence Hall by the artist Ferdinand Richart. 
The painting depicts a summer day outside of Independence Hall, the location where the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were signed. The Green Room also features a number of paintings of important individuals in American history, including President John Quincy Adams, First Lady Louisa Adams, and a portrait above the mantle of First Lady Edith Roosevelt. Also in this room is the painting The Builders by African-American artist Jacob Lawrence. Okay, uh, let's see. All right, and I will search for the Blue Room once we learn a little bit more about that. So the Blue Room is an oval-shaped room that was de uh, designed to be an elegant space by the White House architect or building designer James Hoban. The Blue Room was not always blue, though, and it used to be called the Oval Drawing Room. The Madisons decorated the room in red, and the room was green under President Andrew Jackson's administration. This room received its signature blue color thanks to President Martin Van Buren in 1837. This space mostly hosted receptions and President Grover Cleveland was even married in this room in 1886. Uh, the Belange Furniture, a 53-piece set made for the White House in 1817 under President James Monroe, was made by Pierre Antoine Belange in Paris for use in the Blue Room. In 1860, nearly all of the Blage furniture was sold at a public sale or auction. It was not until 1961 that the White House began to reacquire or buy back the pieces from the original set, and some pieces were simply donated back. Since the Kennedy administration, there has been both original and reproduction pieces on the display in the Blue Room. Most recently, a seven-year restoration of the furniture was completed in the fall of 2018. So if you want to know more about the furniture in that room, uh, there is a link here at the bottom that will take you to that. Um, and then, of course, it would have questions affiliated with that. So let's go take a look at the blue room. And here is the blue room. The blue room is one of the most elegant rooms in the White House. Early on, it was often referred to as the Oval Saloon, the Elliptical Saloon, but the name Blue Room didn't really stick until the Martin Van Buren administration when the colors were changed. This room was designed to primarily buttress President Washington's idea of the presidential levy. This was a ceremony that involved the president greeting guests in a circular form. And to have this type of space would have been high fashion in Europe, and it certainly would have been reflective of having the highest knowledge as president of the United States. The Blue Room has some of the best views in the White House. Looking out those southward windows, one can see the South Fountain, the National Mall, the Washington Monument, even as far as the Jefferson Memorial on the south side of the city. In many ways, the Blue Room is the Monroe's room. Not only are there portraits of James and Elizabeth Monroe standing guard, but many of these French-made objects that are in the room were acquired during the Monroe administration between 1817 and 1824. The most significant historical artifacts in the room are these pieces of furniture. These belong to a suite of furniture that was ordered for the White House by James Monroe in 1817, created by a Parisian cabinet maker named Pierre Antoine Belanger. They were gilded and they were upholstered in red fabric. Originally, there were 53 pieces. Today, 10 pieces have been brought back to the White House collection. The most recently acquired one was a fire screen, which has been reinstalled and placed in the Blue Room. As you look around the south side of the room, you'll see a series of portraits. In addition to President James Monroe and his wife, Elizabeth Monroe, you'll also see likenesses of Presidents James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams. If you look to the north, above the doorway, you'll see another presidential portrait, William Howard Taft. What makes this portrait a little unusual to the room is that Taft had his 
portrait painted in this space. In fact, if you look behind him, you can see the color of the Blue Room as it existed during the Taft administration. Okay. Good to know. Um, I kind of want to go back and see, oops, and uh, see if I'm able to get our 360 tour again. I don't know what happened to that. Let's see if we can get it to come back up. And for whatever reason, we have lost our 360 tour, but that's okay because we have the videos. So we can definitely reference to the videos. And hopefully when you go to do it, you'll actually still have that 360 tour. All right, well, since we're in the colors, let's go on to the red room. It's one of the three state parlors or sitting rooms on the state floor of the White House named after a color. The red color of this room dates back to 1845, James T. K. Polk administration. Before this, First Lady Dolly Madison entertained in this room and had it decorated in a sunflower yellow color. But traditionally, the Red Room has served as a parlor. Under President John Tyler, the portrait of George Washington that you learned about in the East Room hung in this room. It is common for artwork to be moved around the White House to be displayed in different rooms at different times. Rocky Mountain Landscape. This painting of the Rocky Mountains was done by Albert Bierstedt. Beerstep painted the scene soon after returning from a two-year tour of Europe and seven years after traveling west to the Rockies. This painting took elements from various sketches of different landscapes. Some of the mountains closely resemble peaks in the Alps rather than peaks in the Rocky Mountains. Beerstep was cele uh, celebrated for his painting of the American West and documenting west westward expansion in the late 1800s. There are six pieces um, by, the, uh, by this artist in the White House collection. So you can learn more about that um, at the link that will be provided to you um, on the PowerPoint. So let's see if we can find a video on the Red Room. This is the Red Room. The Red Room is one of the most used rooms on the White House state floor. It is typically used for both private events and public events. Originally, the Red Room was used as a breakfast room by President John Adams and then President Thomas Jefferson used it as a formal drawing room. Over time, the room has been used for many different purposes, and in 1845, President James K. Polk added the iconic red color. President Abraham Lincoln liked to use this room as a sitting room at night where he would read papers from around the nation covering the Civil War, and then it has also been used as a entertainment space. President Ulysses Grant loved to use this room for entertaining and would often bring the men to this room after dinner to enjoy cigars and sip brandy. And sometimes on occasion, he would even reenact or recount some of his glory days on the battlefield. This room has also been used for more formal events. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt used this room to host her women's only press conferences. And on March 3rd, 1877, President Rutherford B. Hayes was secretly sworn in in the Red Room following the contested election of 1876. Today, the room is decorated in an empire or Grecian style, which was very popular in the 19th century and included elements of classical art. One of the most notable paintings in the Red Room is a large portrait of Angelica Van Buren. She was the daughter-in-law of President Martin Van Buren and often served as White House hostess. President Van Buren himself is represented by a portrait bust that also is featured in the Red Room. As you enter the Red Room, you will notice a beautiful portrait of First Lady Dolly Madison by Gilbert Stewart. Dolly Madison was well known for her entertaining and hostess duties as First Lady. She also hosted regular Wednesday night receptions at the White House. Other paintings in this room include natural landscape paintings, which depict a number of locations throughout the United States. Okay. 
state dining room. The state dining room has had many uses throughout the history, and in 1902, President Theodore Roosevelt made the room much bigger during his administration's renovation or redesign. This room is often the setting for state or official dinners and is the second largest room in the White House. In 2015, the renovation of this room, a three-year three project overseen by First Lady Michelle Obama, was completed. The mantle in the state dining room features a benediction or blessing by President John Adams. It reads, I pray heaven to bestow the best of blessings on this house and all that shall hereafter inhabit it. May none but honest and wise men ever rule under this roof. These words were taken from a letter written to, uh, to Adams' wife, Abigail Adams, in 1800. They were added to the mantle in 1945 under President Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration. You can learn more about that benediction here at that site. So let's take a look at the state dining room. Here is the state dining room. The state dining room is the second largest room in the White House after the East Room. This room has most often been used as a dining room, but originally under President John Adams, it was used as a reception room, and then President Thomas Jefferson used it as his office and cabinet room. The room was expanded during the 1902 Roosevelt administration renovations of the White House, and during this time, beautiful oak paneling was installed in the dining room. This paneling was originally just dark wood. However, after the 1948 to 1952 Truman renovation of the White House, this was painted to cover any scars from construction. President Franklin Roosevelt added another defining feature to this room. The fireplace includes a blessing from President John Adams, which reads, I pray heaven to bestow the best of blessings on this house and all that shall hereafter inhabit it. May none but honest and wise men ever rule under this roof. Unlike the other state floor rooms, the state dining room only features one painting. This is the iconic painting by George P. A. Healy of President Abraham Lincoln. This was originally painted in 1869. However, President Grant rejected this painting and chose another Lincoln portrait instead. In 1939, the portrait made its way back to the White House where it was decided that it would hang after much discussion in the state dining room where it has typically remained. Okay. The Cross Hall. Cross Hall is a long and narrow hall connecting the East Room to the state dining room, each on opposite sides of the state room before the state dining room was enlarged in 1902, Cross Hall was sometimes used for large formal dinners. Today is a pathway used to connect spaces and serves as a gallery of the presidential portraits. The space is also an area of prominence to display the presidential seal or symbol. The seal is in the center of the hall, just above the entrance to the blue room. There's your seal. There was no official president seal in the early years of presidency, as many presidents used designs based on their own preferences. After White House renovation or redesign in 1902, President Theodore Roosevelt ordered a presidential seal to be incorporated into the floor of the entrance hall. That design incorporated the words, the seal of the president of the United States around the edge. Ultimately, the design we recognize today was created under President Harry Truman and President Dwight Eisenhower updated that design when two stars were added to the flag representing newly admitted states of Hawaii and Alaska. You can learn more about the seal here uh, and in uh, and this link. So let's take a look at the cross hall. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think they give us a video for the cross hall. But we can clearly see it's just a hallway that takes you to a lot of these rooms that we've already covered today. So you can obviously go in and search that a little bit more. Let's see if they have anything about the presidential seal. Oops. Oh, well, here's the cross hall. So this is all about the cross hall. Okay. State dining room, we just saw that. The second floor, the entrance, okay. There we go. I wanted to see if I could see anything about the presidential seal. There's no video on that, but there was a link, so you could follow the link. The entrance hall we see today is very similar to the original entrance hall designed by White House architect or building designer James Hoban. President Thomas Jefferson used this space to display artifacts or objects sent back from Lewis and Clark expedition. Like its name suggests, the entrance hall has always been used to receive guests and to hold large gatherings. More recently, this space has been used to uh, present the president and the first lady as they walk down the grand staircase to the entrance hall from the family quarters of the White House. Uh, so this is a plaque that sits in the floor of the entrance hall. It has four dates, 1792, 1817, 1902, and 1952. The four dates represent major construction, reconstruction, and renovation or redesign. Uh, these are dates in the White House history. 1792 marks the date when the White House cornerstone or first stone was laid. 1817 notes the date of the rebuilding of the White House after the British burned it during the War of 1812. 1902 represents major renovations to the White House completed by President Theodore Roosevelt. And lastly, 1952 marks the completion of the renovations done under President Harry Truman. These dates serve as a reminder that the White House has undergone major renovations and reconstructions throughout its history. So you can learn more about the uh, Truman renovations there. Uh, the entrance hall, let's see if we can find something about the entrance hall. Oh, okay, this is, would be that cross hall. The entrance hall has served as the primary entrance for the White House since the time of Thomas Jefferson up until Theodore Roosevelt in 1902. Presidents have used the entrance hall for different purposes. In Jefferson's time, he used it to display different pieces and artifacts that were sent back from the Corps of Discovery by his secretary, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. In Jackson's time, he actually used the space to put out a mammoth cheese that was gifted to the White House in 1835. There's a series of columns that separate the entrance hall from the cross hall. You'll see dates on the floor. These mark important renovations, reconstructions, and rebuildings in White House history. The first is 1792. The cornerstone was laid for the first White House on October 13, 1792. The next one is 1817. This was after the rebuilding of the White House after the British burned the building during the War of 1812. The next date is 1902. This was a modern renovation that was carried out by Theodore Roosevelt with the assistance of McKim, Mead & White, a very famous architectural firm out of New York. And finally, 1952, the last major renovation in White House history carried out by Harry Truman, which took three and a half years between 1948 and 1952. Truman ordered that a new presidential seal be installed above the doorway of the Blue Room. The gold eagle leg piano in the entrance hall was a gift of Steinway and Sons in 1938 to the Franklin Roosevelt White House. The 1938 Steinway is still used today for White House concerts and primarily by the United States Marine Band, which is the accompanying band for the President and First Lady of the United States. One of the most famous portraits in the Cross Hall 
is the Aaron Schickler portrait of John F. Kennedy. Schickler was chosen to be the artist for both President Kennedy and former First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy, and their portraits were completed in 1970. President Kennedy wasn't alive to be part of the process. You see that portrait of Kennedy deep in thought, contemplating. Now, the only time that Mrs. Kennedy ever returned to the White House was to see her and her husband's portraits. President Nixon and First Lady Patricia Nixon invited them to see the finished portraits in February 1971. They were unveiled to the public, and President Kennedy's portrait has stayed in the cross hall and the entrance hall ever since. information. Okay. Have we gone through everything? I think we have. Look at that. All right. So here are some further ideas for using the materials. Um, so this would be for your homeschool moms or perhaps teachers that may be doing this in your classrooms. You have further exploration, have students identify an object in one of the tour spaces that isn't highlighted, um, ask them to conduct their own research and report back to the class. Uh, you could do a peer-to-peer -peer teaching, breaking students up into small groups and assign each group a space or a few spaces, then have the whole class come back together so each group can repre uh, to present what they've learned learning more about the spaces, the designing, the changes, all those years we saw of renovations. Uh, encourage students to further explore the White House. They can access the video tour. So if we click on the video tour, um, then that would take us to all those videos that we basically just watched. So um, they would be able to conduct their own. Wow, this was a great, great, great field trip. I am really excited that we got the opportunity to uh, do this today. A couple of other things that I want to kind of tell you about. Um, I will have this up so you can follow along with me. I will give you the link. Hopefully that 360 tour will pick back up and you'll be able to use it. If not, there's tons of videos on here to get you going. Um, I'm also going to include a link of Teachers Pay Teachers. Uh, this is all free White House content, so you could download these items and use them to implement uh, into your field trip that you're doing as far as the White House. So I'm going to include that as well. So, All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for being a part of our virtual field trips, destinations, and visits today. Uh, this was all about the White House. We've learned a lot of history um, a lot of information, and there's still a lot more on this site that you would be able to do something with. So keep it going, and uh, any suggestions you may have for future virtual field trips or destinations, travels, and visits, uh, please let me know, and my information will be on that first slide for you. So thanks so much, everybody. Have a great one, and uh, I'm always up for suggestions. Thank you for being a part of it.